Thanks, Bob. It's good to be back in Texas. I had the good fortune of living in Texas uh, in the late 1970s. It's changed quite a bit. Uh, this fiscal uh, solutions tour is trying to help save the republic, the U.S. republic, uh, but we'd like the Texas republic to be saved too, and we know that you have some of your own challenges here. What I'd like to do is to provide you some context before we start getting into solutions. Look, the, the budget has changed dramatically in the last 40 years. You know, the LBJ school where we were last night up at UT was founded 40 years ago, and back then, 42% of the budget was defense. Now it's down to 20%. Now the, the budget is dominated by social insurance programs. And if you look back when LBJ was president in 1966, you'll see there's been a dramatic change in the cost per capita of different programs, Social Security, Medicare, uh, and defense, adjusted for inflation. And if we look at how much discretion Congress has over de determining the budget each year, it's declined dramatically. Back in 1970, it was 62 percent they got to decide how to spend every year. Now it's down to 38 percent in 2000, headed down to 18. Now, interestingly, all of the express and enumerated responsibilities envisioned by the Founding Fathers under the Constitution are in discretionary spending, and yet that's what's getting squeezed. And in addition, investments in the future are in discretionary spending, and that's what's getting squeezed. If you look at historical receipts and outlays uh, per person adjusted for inflation, you'll see that we're spending at about 50% higher level than at the peak of World War II. And in addition to that, the deficit this year is higher than it was at the peak of World War II on a per person basis adjusted for inflation. And while we had the highest debt as a percentage of the economy in the history of the United States at the end of World War II, uh, and we're about half that now, when you look at it from the standpoint of debt per person, adjusted for inflation, we have double the debt per person today than what we had at the end of World War II, and we're adding debt at record rates, and you have to ask the question, what are we getting for it? If you look at some of the countries that have been in the news recently uh, that have either had debt crises or may have debt crises in, in the near future, you'll find that by looking at international monetary fund data, that when you compare our numbers, meaning the United States, to these countries on an apples-to-apples -apples basis by looking at federal, state, and local debt held by the public as a percentage of the economy, we're already worse than Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. We were 10 years away from, from, from Greece when they had their crises, but if you count what we owe Social Security and Medicare, which in my view you should, because it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, guaranteed as to principal and interest. We're less than three years away from where Greece was when they had their crises. Now, we're not Greece, but then again, Greece used to, Greece as the cradle of democracy was the greatest civilization on earth, once controlled most of the known world. Uh, and at the same point in time, Greece has got somebody to bail them out, called the European Union. We don't. Uh, we are have more time, but we are not exempt from the laws of prudent finance. We need to recognize that we're on an imprudent and unsustainable path, and we're going to have to start putting our house in order before we have our own debt crisis. This is what the future looks like. The bars are spending as a percentage of the economy. The line is revenue as a percentage of the economy. If the bar is above the line, that's called a deficit, and that's all you see here. The fastest growing expense, interest and we have historically low interest rates, and the average maturity for our debt is the lowest of any industrialized nation. So once interest rates go up, we will feel it quickly, and this does not consider a, a, a significant interest, interest rate increase due to a risk premium. The healthcare bill, uh, no matter whether you think it's gonna save us money or not, and I don't, uh, the fact is there's broad-based agreement that total health care costs as a percentage of the economy will be higher after the health care reform bill is enacted uh, than if we had not enacted it. Why? Because it costs money to insure 32 million people. Uh, and there weren't really any major changes made uh, dealing with the cost structure. The federal government's already over-promised on health care, 
and it's going to have to restructure its promises and deal with cost drivers uh, probably in 2013, starting in 2013. This is where we're headed on debt to GDP. Uh, that's not a ride that you want to be on. And we're now unduly dependent on foreign lenders. At the end of World War II, we had no foreign debt. We lent money to others. They didn't lend money to us. We've gone from the largest creditor nation in the world to the largest debtor nation, and some of the countries who we're relying on aren't necessarily ones that share our long-term interest. And so we have to recognize that reality. You can read as well as I can. These are the systemic challenges that face all levels of government, federal, state, and local. All governments, or at least a vast majority, have grown too big, promised too much, and waited too long to restructure to varying degrees. Uh, they grew in good times, uh, and now they're having difficult times. And due to these factors, they're going to have to restructure going forward. At the federal level, it means reimposing budget controls, reforming Social Security, engaging in a next round of health care reform, comprehensive tax reform, and then refocusing on what do we want government to do, how should it do business, recognizing that ultimately we're going to have to pay for it. Uh, and we're far short now, and we're going to get even shorter the way we go. State and local governments have to restructure as well, especially Medicaid, pension, retiree health care, and certain other uh, obligations. And as we look forward, we have to recognize that we have a lot of work to do, and it can't get all done at once. And so we're going to have to look at what can we get done in calendar 2011, what are we going to need to prepare the way for, both within Washington's Beltway and around the country with the American people, to be able to make the tougher choices uh, starting probably after the next presidential election, such as the next round of health care reform, comprehensive tax reform, uh, and Social Security reform. Candidly, we ought to do Social Security reform in 2011. We can do it in a way that will exceed the expectation of every generation of Americans, Young people will get Social Security, although at a later age and possibly in a somewhat different form. Seniors are not going to be affected to any significant extent. We have an opportunity to do something constructive, positive, uh, and to show that something can get done, and hopefully we'll get some leadership. The debt ceiling limit. When you look at this adjusted for inflation, you'll see that we started losing our way in the early 80s. And now we're going to have to increase the debt ceiling limit the question is not if we're going to raise it, but how much and in exchange for what. And some of the things that we need to be thinking about is not just short-term spending deals. Those are symbolic victories. You know, let's cut short-term spending. They don't deal with the disease. They treat the symptoms. We have to reimpose tough budget controls with automatic enforcement mechanisms starting in about 2013 that will force Congress to make tough choices and that there will be consequences if they don't. Uh, with your help, we will succeed. Thank you. Alice?